So as everyone will have heard, uh, we'll be recording this session today for other um, prospective students to view on demand after the open day. Um, so if you don't want to be featured in the recording, please um, keep your camera off and you can use the chat um, to ask any questions. Um, if you have any questions that you'd like to ask off the recording, um, please just message um, message one of the hosts and, and we can pause the recording um, during the Q&A for you to ask that. Um, any other question, just send them through. Um, but otherwise, I'll, I'll pass it over to Stephen. Uh, yes, thank you, Alison. Um, and welcome, everyone. Uh, I'm uh, Dr. Stephen Roberts. I'm uh, one of the, the co-directors of the MSc uh, in Global Health and Development, along with my co-director, Dr. Joe Gibbs, who's also joining us for the, the virtual session today. Uh, so very, very pleased to have you all here. Um, as Alison was saying, for those of you who can't um, or, or are unable to put your cameras on, that's fine as well. For those of you who uh, can, please do so. Um, we always aim for these sessions to be uh, as interactive and dynamic as possible as well. Uh, and it also saves me um, having to stare at a bunch of blank screens, which um, no matter how senior in your career you become is always a bit intimidating. So for those of you who would like to put your cameras on, um, please feel free to do so. Um, we're very happy to have you here for uh, this virtual day uh, to talk a little bit about the program. Um, so we're going to be detailing some of the uh, information around the MSc in Global Health and Development uh, related to uh, admissions, um, content, some of the timetable of the program, things that you can sort of um, expect uh, and plan for as you as you think about kind of your your place and, and, and admissions and place in the program as well. Uh, we obviously also um, want to build in time to to talk to you and engage with you today as well. Um, one thing that we will say throughout is um, we always benef benefit from uh, an incredibly diverse cohort. Um, so no doubt uh, you are calling in and joining us from kind of all many different areas of the world uh, and across many different countries today. Um, so looking very much forward to that as well. Uh, as Alison said as well, the session today is also going to be recorded for um, retrospective access or for, for those of you who might have um, signed up but were unable to make it. So a group we plan on doing is um, Dr. Gibbs and myself. Um, we'll be going through the slides today. We have a number of slides about the program. Uh, we'll be interacting with you, uh, taking your questions, taking your comments and reflections as well. Uh, I'm happy to also hand it over to Dr. Gibbs for an introduction. Um, thanks, Stephen. Yeah, it's really uh, great um, to meet you all today um, and to see so many of you joining. Um, so my name's um, Joe Gibbs, and I'm a clinical academic um, in the Institute for Global Health um, at UCL. And as Stephen has said, I co-direct the MSc in Global Health and Development. Thanks, Stephen. Thank you, Joe. Uh, so we do have our uh, slides ready to go, everyone. So um, I think we are excellent. Alison is able to, to show them. So oh, sorry. Can you see the the screen properly, or we can? And I think you just have to go down to the bottom option of the Ooh. yes. There we go. Yeah. Spot oh goodness, on. this is. <laughs> Don't know why I can't go back, but anyways, hopefully this is okay. <laughs> Excellent. Yes, this brings us uh, to the very first slide group. So, uh, as we said, general introductions. Um, also, Michelle, thank you for putting your camera on. I can see you. So nice to nice to see you. Have you joining as well? Um, so, group, we wanted to do a quick build on the introductions that Dr. Gibbs and I um, have talked about. So. Um, we are both global health researchers and global health uh, academics as well, um, from overlapping in, in different areas as well. So a bit about ourselves. I mean, um, I'm a, a lecturer or the equivalent of assistant professor for those of you in North America um, here at the Institute for Global Health. Um, my background is originally in uh, political studies and international relations. So my work very much uh, approaches global health and issues of global health essentially as political problems. Right. Uh, so I'm very much uh, interested in sort of the, the intersection of, of politics and governance uh, within the politics of pandemics and public health emergencies. Um, so for those of you who have been 
probably anywhere uh, on the planet in the past three years. It's been uh, a very busy um, period of research talking about governance, global health governance, um, government strategies around addressing COVID, right? Future outbreaks, future pandemics as well. Um, so for those of you who are on the call today, uh, who might have an interest uh, in global health politics and global health governance and global health security uh, and how this relates to pandemics, public health emergencies and emerging global health challenges, uh, do reach out. I'm always really happy to talk about um, shared areas of interest as well. Um, so that's a little bit about myself and my research profile and sort of the things that I think about and sort of aim to integrate my research into teaching at the Institute in addition to um, my role as, as program co-director. Uh, Joe. Thanks, Stephen. Yes, yeah, so I'm I'm a an associate professor and um, also a consultant in sexual health um, and HIV. Um, and um, my main research interests are, are surrounding digital health, um, health services research, and um, quite critically in the space um, reducing um, health inequalities. Thanks, Stephen. Thank you, Joe. Uh, and I think group, as we said, is, you know, um, Dr. Gibbs and I are going to be, you know, we, we present, we teach, we also sort of lead the program um, through our sort of different areas of research. But as you will find, probably one of the one of the reasons that brings all of you to express interest and involvement on the program, uh, regardless of sort of your academic or research or background training, uh, presumably is the enormous diversity of taught programs, different courses, different modules. Um, research profiles and research projects that are at the Institute for Global Health. So we'll be talking a little bit um, more about that in the presentation today, but very much along the lines of regardless of the approach that you have in global health, uh, whether it's sort of uh, advanced, beginner, uh, medium career, medium research, uh, the different areas you might be interested in, uh, the diversity of the program and of the Institute for Global Health will be well served to all of you uh, on the program as well, sort of regardless of the, the different areas you might be coming from. Um, thank you. Uh, next slide, Alison. Uh, so in addition to um, myself uh, and to Joe, who are the, the co-directors, um, you will also be engaging quite extensively with uh, teaching and research staff uh, during your time in the program as well. Uh, and also with Jack Clark, who I believe is on the call with us today. Uh, so Jack is our um, lead program administrator for the Global Health and Development Program. Uh, so Jack is very helpful in getting in touch with any, any queries about the program, uh, things related to um, admissions, um, things around study in the UK, this type of thing as well. Um, so as I said, Jack, I believe is here. He might be able to speak or take questions later. Um, but again, group, if you have general areas of kind of query or curiosity about the program, um, do reach out to Jack uh, at the, the email that's been provided. Thank you, Alison. Uh, so we always enjoy this section group. So um, this is really, as I said, speaking to the huge amount of diversity that I think, first of all, is present uh, at the Institute and also on the, um, the program in terms of the teaching staff, in terms of the research staff, in terms of the teaching and research culture. So uh, the Institute, we ourselves are an incredibly uh, diverse and dynamic and international and global community. Um, and every year we attract that same kind of reflection in the cohorts who study on the program as well. Uh, it's usually quite a large uh, cohort. Uh, it's very globalized, many different areas of background in terms of academic um, research, methodological training, uh, incredibly diverse. And you will actually all learn an enormous amount of insights and experience and education from each other enrolled on the program as well. So you'll all be bringing these specialties with you. Um, I'd like to open up just the, the floor. So those of you who have, for example, uh, your microphone enabled, or for those of you who'd like to use the chat function, uh, just a little introduction. So first of all, where are you calling in from today? Um, so where in the world might you be living or perhaps studying or working at this moment? And also, what is your background? Are you a social scientist? Are you an applied scientist? Uh, are you a mathematician? Are you an engineer? Are you a medical practitioner? Um, so tell us a little bit about where you're from and also a bit on your previous background, whether that is uh, education, research, or professional engagement right now. So uh, Maria says, calling in from London. Laura's coming from Egypt. Italian, doing a PhD in cancer research and cancer imaging. Excellent. Toronto, international development. 
Liverpool, Washington, DC. Excellent. Lots of things coming into the, uh, the chat function right now as well. Medical practitioner from Germany, from Sheffield, Virginia, Malaysia working in gender and health. Excellent. A doctor from Bangkok. Welcome, Darm. Excellent. Caroline is going from London and from Nigeria with a background in public health. Excellent. So a fair amount of medical practitioners present today. Um, cellular and molecular medicine in University of Bristol, Canada studying life sciences. Excellent. So thank you for that, everyone. And, and as I said, uh, Pleased to meet you all. Hannah from Taiwan, lovely to meet you as well. Hannah, majoring in health promotion and health education, right? So again, group, uh, you are you are supporting the hypothesis that we that we have presented to you and the hypothesis that we always speak about uh, every with the cohort. So you can be assured that the cohort will be international, um, interested in questions around uh, equity and social justice within global health, global health research, and making global health better. Uh, which we'll talk a little bit about in the program uh, further today as well. Uh, and so you will have an enormous amount of, of insight and perspective you will learn from one another, uh, and you will bring that onto the teaching and research components of the program as well. Um, so thank you for sharing everyone so far. Uh, next slide, please, Alison. So uh, a big question. Uh, group of which there is not necessarily one authoritative or universal answer. Uh, but why study global health in 2023? Uh, and if I could ask for somebody to be brave or bold, I would. I open the, the floor for the the microphone. So if someone would like to speak, perhaps, uh, why study global health according to you in 2023? Floor is open. Hi, Stephen. Happy to happy to jump in here. Um, so I don't have a health background, but I've been working in international development for roughly mm -hmm. the past five years. Um, and I've, you know, that overlaps a lot with various health contexts. And I've just seen how health is really kind of the fundamental, um, fundamental like building block as to the prosperity mm -hmm. of nations, communities, individuals. Um, so interested in just starting from the ground up and health is, um, health is vital to the development of Absolutely everything. So very interested in studying it. Thank you. And that was Michaela, that was you speaking? Yeah, that was Michaela. Thanks. Excellent. And where are you calling in from, Michaela? Um, I'm in Washington. here in Washington, DC. Right. Excellent. Thank you, Michaela. And as you said, health is as the building block, right? If, if you don't have health, if communities don't have health, there's not really much else that can be done, right? Excellent. Thank you. Anyone else? Why study global health in 2023? If I may, um, I think health is a really interesting topic at the moment, mm -hmm. insofar as it like interacts with the environment and environment, environmental change. So I think now is, especially now is the time to be looking at how those interact and see how we can plan better for the future mm -hmm. within a health context as well. Excellent. Thank you, Michelle. So yes, uh, health being sort of, you know, health linked to the present, health linked to the future, right? Particularly when we think of the, and group, you will, you will be engaged extensively with this, um, the intersecting nature of health, right? Or as I often say, when, when teaching research, understanding health beyond health, right? Or beyond healthcare systems, this networked understanding of all of the things that we have to think about and factor in and plan and prioritize when we think about addressing global health on one hand, and developing successful interventions and solutions to pressing global health problems in the present, but that have very sort of serious future implications. Um, so excellent point. Thank you, Michelle. Anyone else want to contribute as to why we study global health in 2023? 
Hello, everyone. And um, this is MM from Nigeria. Mm -hmm. Well, for me, um, it's again an opportunity to be able to gain an understanding of delivering healthcare and understanding disparities and protection, protecting uh, my country, for example, and um, against global health threats like um, subject areas in social justice and um, equity. Just like you mentioned earlier, so that's an opportunity for me to be able to develop the skill. Also, yes, get understanding in this area. Excellent, thank you, Emma, and thank you for thank you for those contributions and for not for not leaving me hanging for too long on on the call. Um, <laughs> but as you said, um, you know what I think one thing that brings everybody to this and, and really what is um, what this program is known for. Uh, in terms of being globally recognized, in terms of the teaching quality, in terms of the research outputs by the team, in terms of the caliber of, of the cohorts and the students, is this commitment to social justice, right, and addressing themes of equity and inequity within global health, right? And these are very, very strong themes and practices that are going to be present on all of your modules uh, and very much within the spirit of the program as well. Um, so again, if this is something that everybody's kind of interested in, it, it is very going to be a dominant feature uh, of the program uh, throughout your time. So thank you again, uh, Iman, for, for bringing that attention again, as you said, to uh, not only addressing global health challenges and global health problems, but very much through the framework of understanding inequities and inequities within global health. Great, so thank you everyone for, for feeding back into that so far. Uh, we can go to the next slide, I think, Alison. So group, what I want to do uh, is put a few quotes on when we think about, so obviously we've had a bit of feedback on why to study uh, global health in 2023, but also what is global health or what do we think global health is or what do we associate it with? Um, so we have a number of definitions that we can kind of take a few minutes just to reflect on. So what do we think, group? Uh, and you can you can call these out. We can put them in the comment boxes. We can discuss these. But when we think about global health, uh, what is it, right? Global health are the health issues that transcend national boundaries and governments, can call for actions on the global forces that determine the health of people. Uh, global health can be thought of as a notion, as a current state of global health, an objective, a world of healthy people or a mix of scholarship, research, and practice. Global health is a fundamental human right to be protected and a moral obligation demonstrated by action. It results in change that improves the health of individuals and populations. Or global health is dependent on gender bias. Women predominantly occupied unpaid, unpaid roles as caregivers and health workers, and this disparity needs to be recognized and the labor paid. Let me just take a few minutes, group, and just sort of read through these, reflect on them. Uh, and then we'll be very interested to kind of just get some of your thoughts, initial thoughts on some of these definitions and how they speak to you. So group, the, the next slide, which we will we'll stay on this page for now, but it's um, it's more just the, the next slide was actually just asking you what you think of these definitions. Uh, do they capture your understanding of global health in 2023? Yeah. Uh, is there anything missing? Yes. I think somebody was went to speak. Sorry, I think I accidentally unmuted. <laughs> Um, but I, I, I do have some thoughts on this um, as well. Um, I'm kind of hesitating between A and B definition. Mm -hmm. I think I'm slightly more drawn to A of global health as a concept. I mean, there is global health, for example, 
research as well, but I think as a concept, it's um, health that, as, as it says, transcends national boundaries and um, elements, shall we say, global health is determined by things that are not necessarily restricted within um, one nation, but they can also be diverse. I think it probably captures the concept best. It's in mm -hmm. for, for me personally. Great. Great. Thank you for that, Michelle. As you said, I mean, global health on, on one hand is, I mean, it, it is a concept, right? It's an idea. We can say that it's, it's theoretical or it's normative, right? And then we can also talk about, um, you know, the practice of global health, teaching global health, researching global health, implementing global health, studying global health, um, all of which is contested and problematic, right? As you will find on the program um, for, for many different reasons, right? We talk about evidence, we talk about perspectives, we talk about history. Um, excellent. Um, Marta has said, I think A and C best fit the global health concept. Okay, so aspects of human rights, understanding it through lens of human rights, health issues that transcend national boundaries. Excellent. Maria said it could be C. Okay. Um, Charlotte, as global health is a promise to focus our attention on trying to attain equitable access to well being and resources. Excellent. And Nikki, yes, all of the options provide a valid definition of global health. It could all be considered correct depending on different contexts. Right, and we will talk about the importance of context and the importance of site uh, throughout the program as well. Right, as I often say, group, um, you can't understand global health without first understanding local health as well. Right. All right, so I think we can move on then, group. But again, as we said, um, no set definition. Right, this is a this is a, a concept that's in constant flux constant contestation. Uh, it's evolving, right? We can say that many aspects of global health are quite recent when we think of long established historical patterns, right? We can also understand uh, global health growing out and being very much in sort of the legacies of previous historical trends, which we will, we will actually speak a little bit about uh, in the presentation uh, today as well. So I think we can move on actually to the, the next slide. This was actually just the slide that we we're getting a prompt for your thoughts on this as well. Um, I think we can just move to the next slide. And I think Ruth, this, this picks up quite well on sort of the origins of global health, right? So this idea that um, we have to understand global health, uh, how it's politically, contextually, is historically situated as well, right? We can understand global health as a as a relatively recent uh, practice, a relatively recent understanding, idea, uh, commitment uh, by countries, by, by global health actors. But we can very much situate it in a long sort of line of relationships, politics, relationships of history, relationships with, um, with biomedicine, with knowledge, power interfaces, right? And often understanding the political historic, economic, and medical sort of overlap and origins of global health, it presents us sort of an understanding of global health as, as an iterative product of a number of different movements, right? We can talk about the origins of, of colonial medicine, which has given, given raise and origin to um, a lot of sort of problematic aspects that still find themselves presenting in global health today. The relationships between uh, tropical medicine, right, which, which followed colonial medicine, uh, but brought with it sort of many of the, the same sort of problematic practices and, and uh, power structures uh, and extractive practices, uh, which then gave way to sort of 20th century international health. Uh, and then has led to, as we said, the, the recent uh, growth and indeed sort of um, proliferation of global health sort of in the early uh, 21st century. Uh, next slide, please. So as we said, group, um, it is impossible to, to understand sort of the, the origins of global health um, on one hand, and indeed the, the problems and the need to overcome past issues in global health without understanding, particularly with our own positionality of being a research institute based in the United Kingdom, right, based in the West or the North, however you want to 
use these contested terms um, with that of colonial medicine, right? And this is um, a legacy that University College London shares uh, along with King's College, along with London School of Economics, along with LCHDM, um, but of being situated very much in the production of colonial medicine, right? Colonial medicine, as we said, it, it emerged very much within the project of expansionism uh, and the colonial project, which, which characterized most parts of the world, right, for, for very, very long spans of history. Essentially, within colonial medicine, uh, we saw the expansion of um, military administration and civilians, right, in colonies in parts of the world. Uh, very much the perspective that within colonial practices of medicine, the health of laboring populations uh, essentially was there uh, to support the power of the colony, right, and the expansion of, of empire. Um, within colonial medicine, there were a lot of pilot studies, uh, epidemiological studies concerned with um, production, concerned with economy, uh, concerned with populations in, in the making of the colonial system as well. And what we need to recognize and continually understand is that at the heart of colonial medicine were practices of racism, economic circulation, and health, right? These things interacted all together. And essentially, colonial medicine was a very distinct project, uh, which grew of colonialism and was very much uh, an extractive, long-standing project. So we recognize that many of the problems when we think about power dynamics, when we think about particular gazes, uh, when we think about um, knowledge power interfaces, when we, when we talk about what type of curriculum is taught at the expense of other programs, for example, uh, we recognize that global health as we know it today has been very much shaped um, by the colonial project and by colonial practices of medicine. This is something that uh, we are rightly called upon uh, to be decolonial, in our approaches to understanding challenges within global health. Um, we talk about global health research, we talk about global health education. Uh, and this is something that we actively engage as research communities, teaching communities, uh, and also in the relationships between the cohorts and the program as well, is the need to recognize this history and to work in ways that work towards social justice, so social equity, and a recognition of the essentialness of decolonial practices within current systems of global health. Uh, next slide, please. As we said, group colonial medicine uh, established sort of the basis of this very um, particular period, uh, which predated global health, which later gave rise to tropical medicine, right, of which London universities were, again, very much um, uh, part and involved and implicated in as well. So tropical medicine focused very much on um, the control of diseases and spread of diseases from colonial regions, right, to core regions, right? Uh, it es essentially oftentimes sought to treat and control epidemics and outbreaks by controlling vectors, right? But not recognizing or treating people, conditions, or local contexts that were in fact created and in many cases exacerbated by colonial rule. Um, colonies within tropical medicine and within perspectives of tropical medicine very much uh, were regarded as a vector for transmission, right, due to in-health inequalities and inequities, which were uh, unrecognized. Um, and also, as we said, this was also a period in which colonies and colonial populations served very much as health laboratories, right, so designing particular interventions around vector control uh, and disease control but with very little to no understanding of the driving causes of actually disease and vector uh, issues within these areas. Uh, next slide, please. So as we said, group, uh, over really the past, we could say maybe perhaps 25, 30 years, recognizing the early origins uh, in which global health was, was essentially formed and driven along, we've seen the emergence now of global health. Right. And one thing that we can uh, really use as a distinguishing factor of global health and how it might be different uh, from previous systems of international health or public health, uh, which overlap but are also distinct as well, is this emphasis on global cooperation. 
right? But what does this mean group? What, what is global cooperation? What does it look like? How do we accomplish it? How do we accomplish it when we also recognize previous systems of unbalanced power, uh, of exploitation, of extraction, of history, of the legacy of colonialism in all parts of the world as well? So talking a little bit about uh, thinking always about how do we achieve global cooperation, right? And how do we also situate things like social justice, uh, importance of contexts, and attention to equity and inequities in health systems and global health when we do think about global cooperation. So I think uh, I'm going to hand the slides over to Dr. Gibbs to build on talking about global cooperation, how do we work together, and what are some of the challenges that might be facing us? Thanks, Stephen. Right, yeah, so, um, yeah, as Stephen said, I'm now gonna take you through um, a series of different um, maps or cartographs that really illustrate some of the challenges we're currently facing um, in terms of global health. Um, what we have here is a cartograph of global health workers shortage across regions and countries. Um, and this is basically, the countries are repositioned um, by the extent that that country is impacted by healthcare shortage. And from this, I think it's really clear that you can see that low and middle income countries are disproportionately affected um, compared to high income countries. And this is really exacerbated by um, what's known as the, the sometimes, sometimes known as the brain drain of healthcare uh, workers um, and healthcare practitioners from low and middle income countries who either immigrate um, to or are recruited by um, health income, um, high income country health systems. So, uh, um, so you, you can just see, uh, this is one way I think of just um, illustrating um, some of the inequity at a um, global level. Um, next slide, please. Um, one of the key me uh, measures of population health is life expectancy. Um, and um, you know, people dying um, uh, earlier than they um, that they otherwise would do. Um, um, and um, I think this graph this this graph is um, shows life expectancy in 2021. Um, and again, you can see there's huge differences um, ac across um, the world in terms of life expectancy, which goes um, from a, people are life expectancy of 50s and 60s in um, sub-Saharan Africa, for example, to over 90, um, to 90 years um, in some places, um, high income countries, including um, Japan. And there's um, over uh, there's a 30 year difference between um, the areas of the world that have got the lowest life expectancy compared to those that have the highest life expectancy. Um, next slide, please. But it's not just life expectancy, it's also healthy lives um, of living. And this um, graph shows you the burden of disease in 2019 uh, using a measure called disability adjusted life years. And this takes into account both years of life lost due to a premature death, but also years living with a disability. And so one DALI um, equals one lost year of life. And you can again see in, in this that it's quite clear that um, in low and middle income countries, the, 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 the number of years, that, the number of Dallas is much higher, so 80,000, 90,000, compared to um, um, high income countries, where it's around 10, 20,000. Next slide, please. And this graph is basically looking um, at um, looking at the life course from um, uh, from from the, the, the um, from neonates, so um, um, babies at the point that they've just been born, going right up through to people living who are seventy five to seventy nine years of age, and looking at um, what's um, what's you know what's called what's causing um, death within these um, age groups, um, and what we've really seen in um, recent years is a shift from um, infectious disease causing um, a lot of morbidity and more, um, mortality to um, uh, um, non-communicable diseases um, bearing, having an increasing 
a burden where, uh, where healthcare systems have improved, there's been improvements in sanitation, um, access to medication. Um, we've seen a reduction in deaths from infectious diseases, but at the same time, we've seen a rise in, in terms of changes in li people's lifestyles um, and things like that. We've seen a rise in um, um, non-communicable diseases. Um, and again, low and middle income countries really uh, are disproportionately affected again by both of these. Um, next slide, please. It's incre becoming increasingly clear um, that digital health or digital technologies are a determinant of um, health. Um, and this is a uh, this is a map basically illustrating mobile subscriptions per hundred people and total reported COVID nineteen cases by country, um, and was published by um, UCL researchers in two thousand and twenty. And what you can see um, here is that where you've got a high um, high numbers of mobile subscriptions per hundred people, you've also got um, high numbers of total reported COVID-19 cases. Um, and this isn't because of 5G causing COVID. This is more this is more to do with the fact that actually in these countries um, where they've got high mobile subs um, subscriptions with high income countries, you, you people have access to digital technology data capture on outcomes of um, reported cases of COVID is much higher. Um, and even that being able to access testing in these areas is much higher than it would be it, 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 it is in um, low and middle income countries. And next slide, please. And this is a graph um, that um, uh, Stephen showed um, earlier, um, and it really uh, nicely illustrates it's the Lancet puzzle for ensuring global health security and all the different inter connecting um, um, factors that need to come together really complex because in terms of the complex challenges of providing global health security for all including access to healthcare, healthcare systems, education, um, food security, um, um, access to medicines, the impact of um, famine and um, conflict and all of these come together um, to really um, cause the complex challenges of providing global um, security, health security for all. And next slide, please. So, and what challenges do we face? Well, we've obviously seen in recent years, we've seen the huge impact of COVID-19 as an emerging infectious disease that's um, caused um, a pandemic. Um, pandemic. We've also um, increasing evidence of the impact of climate change but can people think of other challenges that we um we are currently facing um mental health feels yeah. like it's kind of coming to the fore not only in terms of people's awareness but in the ways that people work now going to more of like a di like digital working i think people learning how to um interact in new ways yeah exactly that's a really good point um and i can see um you've also got war and conflict which again is, is another really um um um, um yep yeah, hospital healthcare capacity nutrition these are all really key um points thank you so i'm going to hand back over to stephen at this point Thank you. Uh, thank you, Joe. And thank you, Group of War and Conflict. Um, Cheryl has also said other challenges, hospital healthcare capacity limits, right? We see um, we see public public systems really pushed uh, in a, in a post-COVID-19 uh, situation, right? We see also the status of healthcare workers, right? There's not enough support, there's not enough financing, there's not enough organization. We can talk about uh, exodus from the profession, we can talk about professional burnout. Um, Marta has said nutrition. Right, so really capturing the the very broad and ongoing and, and evolving scope of challenges when we think about challenges in global health. Right, so on one hand, on the program we think about cooperation. Right, so how to work together, 
how to share insights, how to share context and experience and be evidence driven in developing our approaches, but also always trying to understand uh, and uncover on earth who is driving the responses to these challenges, right? So who are the actors who are uh, responding to and improving or undermining global health, right? Just always thinking about kind of these stakeholders, these actors and these different networks uh, that very much um, impact on present global health, but also in future global health as well. Uh, next slide, please. So when we think about the actors involved, right, group, um, this is a very kind of uh, small uh, presentation of networks, right? We can think of uh, the NHS, obviously very much if we think in a British context or a UK context, this idea of the NHS being sort of at the forefront of public health, but also global health as well, especially when you think of its role in uh, COVID uh, over the past few years. And we can think of sort of established groups like the World Health Organization, which is always regarded as sort of the front and center, uh, primary sort of global health, public, international public health actor. Uh, we can talk about, you know, Gavi, Global Vaccine Alliance. We can talk about COVAX, which, you know, uh, came to life very much in the context of COVID-19. UN AIDS, uh, the Global Polio Eradication Initiative, uh, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, right, and the role that these private philanthropic capitalist groups have in shaping and informing uh, present and global health programming as well. We can think, for example, group about um, the individuals and the communities and the activists, right, that we can now think of as being central to global health and driving global health and, and the concerns around global health, for example, the Black Lives Matter movement. Uh, which was observed, obviously, in the context of the COVID-19 pandemic uh, and have been instrumental in sort of leading to the recognition that racism is a public health threat, right? That's been recognized in the United Kingdom. It's also been recognized in, in the United States as well, uh, in no small part due to the Black Lives Matter movement. And then, of course, group, it forces us to think of um, perhaps more controversial actors, right? So what about the private sector, right? Do we now think that Google and Apple for example, for the, the prominence in which they played with digital contact tracing apps during the pandemic, do we now think of them uh, as global health actors or particularly influential global health actors who are driving certain agendas to certain outcomes and effects, right? But always thinking group, um, who are the actors? What are their agendas? What are the policies they're implementing or pushing? And ultimately, what are the outcomes, right, on things like social justice uh, and health equity and inequities in global health? Right? So you're going to be constantly pushed to think who is front and center, who is at the table in global health, and who is not at the table, right? And for what reasons? Uh, next slide, please. We're also going to be thinking extensively throughout the program on um, the place of, of things like concepts like power, um, but also of trust as well, right? So global cooperation implies the need for trust and proactive working together. Right, but we need to think how much trust can there be between countries, right? If we think of the divisions between high income and low and middle income countries, right? Or global north and global south, for example. Uh, how can we understand these processes of trust, particularly when we think of realities of politics, history, economy, and power, right? How do we understand trust in the local, right, versus the global? So how much local ownership do people in communities have over their own health or their own health programmings or their own health interventions, right? And is trust possible given the problematic history of global health, right? Do we need to be thinking broadly or, or in, in other uh, conceptual frameworks, right? But always thinking about power and trust and sort of the intersecting realities and contestations of these really important terms uh, within global health. Uh, next slide, please. Obviously, when we think to group about uh, issues of trust, issues of power, issues of uh, resource allocation, uh, prioritization of planning and allocation of resources and power, um, we can see very marked global inequities and very marked global challenges on a global scale, right? And I think in the past few years, nowhere has this presented itself, uh, I think, more stark and in the context of COVID-19, which we've seen kind of massive impacts for social justice and inequity uh, in all countries considered and affected. But also when we look, for example, group at um, the still continued very uneven and inequitable rollout and development and access to COVID-19 vaccines, 
right, across different areas of the world, uh, driven by things like vaccine nationalism uh, and resource, resource hoarding of vaccines and things of intellectual property rights uh, with high income countries on one hand, um, but then very much with corporate interests on the other, right? And as we said, group, this has happened before, right? We can look at HIV medication and the TRIPS patents. Um, so locating these historical processes and how these inequities continue to present themselves within present global health systems and thinking very much about how to overcome barriers like this and also addressing issues of trust and power between countries and communities. Uh, next slide. And so, Gru, uh, in enabling you to think about these, you know, very formidable, um, entrenched, long-standing, and sort of future-situated challenges as well, um, we will be offering a multidisciplinary approach to thinking about these problems, to developing solutions and interventions, and to ensuring that all of these interventions and responses are always driven by evidence, right? What does the evidence tell us about the best way to approach this particular global health problem, right? So we'll be offering a multidisciplinary program that brings in uh, many different perspectives, many different methods, many different areas of training, including anthropology, development studies, digital health, economics, epidemiology, geography, psychology, public health, and sociology, to name a few. Uh, next slide, please. You will be taught uh, by world leading specialists, right? Who are not only, uh, as we said, leading and recognized within their fields, but incredibly diverse in training and perspectives as well, uh, within an institute that is also uh, incredibly friendly, right? Which emphasizes EDI, equality, diversity, and inclusion, uh, and participatory in its approach. Next slide, please. So as we said, group, this is just to speak a little bit and to detail some of the um, quite extensive interdisciplinary global health work that's done at the Institute. So obviously um, that is a, a photograph of uh, quite a small proportion of our staff. So we have teaching staff, we have teaching and research staff, we have clinical staff, we have research staff over three different sites. Um, so this is actually quite a relatively small photo of the larger IGH community right, which works across many different sites and areas, but obviously work on um, uh, the global mental health um, and child marriage network, right? We have work done on measuring and evaluating sexual health in an era of digital health challenges, incorporating non-expert evidence into the surveillance and early detection of public health emergencies, and community phone mobile messaging to present, prevent type 2 diabetes in Bangladesh, right? So to give you just a very small uh, taste of some of the cutting edge research and interdisciplinary research that's undertaken at IGH. So we're going to be talking a little bit about the development of the program now, uh, which uh, Joe is going to um, detail for you. Yeah, thanks, Stephen. So um, in terms of um, what what does the MSC actually involve? Um, and it, it, whether you're do, doing it um, full time, part time over two years or modular flexible, um, basically during that, that period of time, you complete, uh, complete four compulsory core modules, which are each worth 15 credits. You then get to choose um, four optional modules. And we've got a really large selection of diverse, interesting um, optional modules to choose from, which are also each worth 15 credits. And then you do a dissertation, which is worth 60 credits. So overall, um, you, you will get 180 credits, um, which is um, what is required to be awarded an MSc. Next slide, please. And in term one, the focus is on the core modules, um, and these um, include concepts and controversies, um, which um, Dr. Roberts um, leads, and this explores key issues in global health. Um, and uh, you learn, taking it from a, a theoretical perspective and learn conceptual frameworks for, for analyzing these key issues. Um, and it's a really um, excellent introduction to global health and the MSc. Um, the next, um, you do that in the first half of the first term and the other module that runs um, at the same time is research methods 
and evidence for global health. So you do the two, if you're doing it full time, you'll, this is what your first half of the first term will look like. And with this module, you learn how to measure health using the key epidemiological and statistical tools, qualitative analysis and critical appraisals. So you get um, both quantitative and qualitative uh, sk skills, as well as um, learning how to critically appraise evidence. And then once you've completed both of those, you move on to the second half of term one, which covers power and politics in global health, where you analyze the power dynamics and political dimensions of global health to understand who are the actors and what their agendas are, and also do health systems in a global context, which looks at financing and organization of health systems um, at a global um, around the world. Um, and the really did um, emphasize on the key issues related to the demand for and supply of quality care um, and looking at different healthcare systems. Next slide, please. And then the optional modules, as I said, you do four from a range of modules across um, the Institute for Global Health, but also more broadly through UCL. And the way these are arranged, that some are short modules, so they run over a three week period and others are, um, are long modules that you do, for example, one day a week over a 10 week period. And this really gives um, um, you and um, other students the uh, flexibility um, to be able to study in a way that best meets your own needs. Next slide. Um, and these are some of the um, different um, topics and areas that are covered within the optional modules from urban health to gender and global health, politics, epidemiology, sanitation, children's well-being, digital health, health economics. So it's really broad um, um, security, really broad um, spectrum of um, uh, topics. And that you, you'll also find um, that some of these are focused on acquiring new skills. So again, Dr. Roberts um, leads one in terms of um, a module focused on qualitative research skills and providing more um, depth to um, that. Um, and we also have some um, on um, developing quantitative skills as well, or evaluating interventions. Um, yeah, so next slide, please. And then moving on to the MSc dissertation, which is a key part of the time. Um, and you get to choose an in-depth academic investigation of your, your own choice, which can be a contribution to the field. You can really, it's your opportunity to make a contribution to the field of global health. Um, it's a piece of original, relevant and critical work. Um, and you, um, it's, um, it gives you an opportunity to actually really feed into the, um, the world of research that you will have um, been exposed to. Um, as um, part of the MSc. I and mean, there's a, a range of different types of dissertation you can do from um, secondary data analysis, qualitative data analysis, secondary uh, quantitative data analysis, primary data collection, literature reviews, action plans. So um, really broad, again, um, opportunities in terms of type of uh, dissertation that you can take on. Um, and it's, it, they, dissertations do tend to be quite challenging, but they're also really exciting. And um, it's a chance for you to really do something, uh, focus on something, an area that you're really interested in. Um, next slide, please. There's also outside of um, the um, academic side of things, there's also a number of different ways you can get involved at UCL from clubs and societies, student reps for the MSc course is a really key role um, um, change makers, which provide opportunities and funding to students, staff who want to work together to enhance the learning of students. We have a um, active IGH um, decolonizing global health network. There's uh, different research centers. We've got ten of them which you can connect to, and there's a summer internship program. Next slide, please. Um, and um, it really. Do get in touch with us if you have any questions and the best way to do that is to contact um, Jack Clark, um, who Stephen mentioned, who's on this call today, who's um, the um, course administrator on the email address here. Next slide. Thank you. So that was a bit of a whistle stop store. I'm aware it's just over two o'clock, um, but does anyone have any questions they would like to ask? No, do 
um, is the African Trust scholarship still available? Stephen or Jack, do you know the answer to that question? Uh, yes, so to my knowledge, Nor, we, um, the African uh, Graduate Scholarship is um, usually offered in years at IHH as well. So what I would say, if you do have interest in, in that, and you know, if you have interest around the deadlines and the process of application and availability, um, I would send that email actually to, um, to Jack Clark on the, uh, the IGH email. Um, and that's something we can then dedicate our attention to. So if it is something you're interested in, please send an email uh, with an expression of interest. And I think, um, so Mugambi, um, are there PhD programs? Yes, we've got a number of um, PhD programs um, within UCL, and we can also um, provide, um, including, the, you know, that it was all funded from um, by different um, funding programs and uh, across a number of different disciplines. Um, that um, and we, as part of the program, we arrange career sessions where we get students who um, have um, done the MSc and who've gone on to do PhDs to talk to you um, quite early on within the course. So um, yeah, there's definitely opportunities to go on to do a PhD. Nikki, yes, G sorry, Stephen, do you want to respond to this one? Uh, are GHD students able to partake in the IGH summer internship program while pursuing their MSc? Uh, yes, and in fact, uh, Nikki, that's the that's often the focus um, is that there's you know it provides additional sort of paid work and experience for students who are able to do so, uh, usually in the period of the summer period um, when they're sort of working on their MSc as well. And, and thanks, Alison. So I can see Alison's pops into the chat, um, the UCL scholarship finder for those of you who are, are interested in applying for a scholarship. So the programme is um, it's a research degree. Uh, thanks, Andrea. But we have a lot of um, we have a lot of healthcare. We have a lot, as Stuart Stephen said, we got a really diverse um, group of people from different backgrounds um, and from across the world coming on. And quite a lot of them are professionals or go on to go on to some, becoming a professional via the MS um, via the MSc. But it's it's classified as a research degree. Um, can I ask a question about kind of dissertation thesis I mean how much um, flexibility as you've said there's quite a lot of flexibility in the format of, of, of the dissertation itself is there kind of flexibility in um, shall we say the topics or is it more restricted in, in that element uh, no that's a very good question um, Michelle and so um, it's very open right so what we always say for the dissertations is that whatever the area of global health that the student opts to research in context for the dissertation, um, the topic should be decided in terms of interest by the student and then sort of just discussed in terms of delivery with the supervisor. Um, so, you know, it's kind of up to the student to have, I think, first of all, a general idea of what they might like to look at. And then that develops and becomes more precise and finite the more you work with your supervisor who can guide and advise on things like this. Thank you. And Julia asked if there's opportunities to get involved in the research we're doing. And I'll say, yes, absolutely. Um, either quite often um, as part of your dissertation, there's opportunities to be involved with the research that's being conducted um, uh, by different academic staff members um, in the Institute for Global Health, but also with, with the um, internships in the summer. Um, and I've known a number of students who've actually gone on and got um, research assistant or um, associate roles, um, having completed the um, MSc before going on and then doing a PhD. So um, there's, there are definitely lots of opportunities.
Great. Well, I'm aware that we've um, overrun um, a bit. So thank you for staying on. Um, and thank you so much for joining us today. Do get in touch if you've got any further questions um, uh, about the MSC. Um, we'd be really happy to hear from you um, and to respond to any queries. Yes, and thank you everyone for all of your uh, your great engagement and questions so far. Um, and we look forward to, to hearing from you and, and hopefully sort of welcoming you um, at some point next autumn onto the program.